<laughs> All right, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. Let's go ahead and get started for today. As I'm sure you're all hopefully aware of, uh, the big topic on our agenda for this week is the exam that is coming up this Thursday. So here's what's going to happen for today. I'm going to talk a little bit just about some general expectations for the exam, try to answer as many questions, calm as many anxieties as I can, and then uh, we'll have a hopefully have a good chunk of time uh, for you all to ask some questions and go through some practice problems and just uh, review all the concepts that are going to be uh, coming up on this Thursday's exam. First, let's uh, take a few minutes just to talk about logistics. Um, this is going to be an evening exam, so it's going to start at 6.30. Uh, this Thursday, um, the location depends on your ID number. So the exam is taking place in four different rooms. This is based on the last three digits of your ID number. So uh, your last three digits of your ID tell you which room to go to. I would like uh, to, uh, most of these rooms are pretty well known. Uh, Simon one right here are very big reduction halls. Uh, a lot of men as well. Uh, McDonald can be a little tricky to find. If you, especially if you're in that one, I would suggest trying to find it before the exam so that you know where to go and you're not frantically uh, trying to figure out where to go at 6.30 on Thursday. So be sure you know where you're going. Be sure you know where uh, you need to be to take this exam. In terms of what you can bring and what you can use on the exam, when you come into the room, you're probably going to be asked to put your backpack uh, up at the front. And so the only things you really need are some pencils and your ID card. You definitely need your ID card because they're going to be checking your ID card uh, when you uh, turn your exam in at the end of the session. And that's about it. Uh, no electronic device. Oh, well, there's one other thing as well. No electronic devices of any kind are allowed. So no phones, no nothing. Uh, they use electricity. You do not need a calculator. Yes, there, there might be some arithmetic on the exam. It will be a very simple arithmetic that you can do either in your head or just off, to, off on the side in the margins if that's what needs to be done. It's been written to intentionally, hopefully, be uh, a arithmetic. It's easy enough to do in your head. Do not need a calculator. No calculators will be allowed on this exam whatsoever. You can bring a sheet of paper with you with notes on it. So please uh, spend some time uh, making this ahead of time. It's a great way to study for the exam. Think about what areas you need, you know, a little extra help in. Put that stuff on your sheet. So you put whatever you want on there. One regular size sheet of paper, uh, you know, both sides, front and back. You can type it. You can write it out by hand. You can do whatever, whatever you want to. Uh, there's just a couple of hopefully common sense rules to keep in mind, right? I'm not going to go along with a ruler and measure everybody's uh, paper down to a centimeter, but if you bring in, you know, a sheet of paper that's the size of this table, then we're going to have a conversation about it, right? It needs to be a regular size sheet of paper, notebook paper, printer paper, whatever the case may be. If you bring in something that looks really large, then I'm going to tell you you can't use it. The other thing to keep in mind about your uh, sheet of notes, um, you should not have to do anything special or fancy to be able to read what's on there. I, if I'm walking down the aisles on exam day, you should be able to pick up your, your sheet of notes and look at it and be able to tell exactly what your, what your notes are. I should not have to use 3D glasses, right? I should not have to use any other form of eye equipment to see the invisible ink that you've printed on your sheet of notes to get an extra layer of stuff on there, right? That's not, uh, that's not what, uh, uh, what this is about. Other than that, it's up to you. You can put anything on your want. I, I don't care. You can write as tiny as you want, as long as you can still see it, right? Um, you won't be able to use a microscope, but you know, if you can see it with the naked eye, then go for it. That's totally fair game. Um, let me think. If there's anything else I need to talk about regarding uh, logistics. Uh, hopefully you're already aware of this, but if you uh, have accommodations on the exam, uh, please get that on the schedule with the DR as soon as possible. I know many of you have already done this. Uh, but you will not be able to use any extended time accommodations or really any accommodations in the, in the main exam room. Uh, so please talk to DR, get that set up. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I think that does it for uh, logistics. Does anybody have any questions about uh, not what's on the exam, but just where to go, when to be there, what you can bring? Any questions? Yes? Are you allowed to use the restroom? I'm sorry? Are you allowed to use the restroom? Yes, absolutely, 100%, yeah. Uh, you just can't take anything out of the room with you besides yourself. 
you know, obviously you gotta leave your exam and stuff. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. So if you have extended time, will like VR allow you to use it and put you in a different room? They will have a they have a testing center, so you'll you'll have to go take it there. That's uh, how it works. Yeah. Any other questions I can answer about logistics or happen to exam content kinds of questions? Okay. Fantastic, that's great. Um, so then let's talk about what's gonna be on this thing. So, I mean, it's kind of simple for the first exam. Everything we've talked about so far is fair game on this exam. We've specifically talked about three different topics. And just to make sure you're aware, I, I hope you're already aware of this. I've posted about it on Piazza a couple of times, and I think I mentioned it last week in class as well. Uh, but there are some uh, prep materials, some study materials that you can use, including a practice exam, uh, a practice uh, quiz rather, with uh, those are all from past exam questions. You might recognize some of those from the quizzes you took earlier in the semester. That's not a coincidence. That's absolutely 100% intentional. The questions you've been taking on the quizzes every week also past exam questions. At every semester, I just add them, add them to the question bank and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, those are all past exam questions. And then there's a repository with uh, coding prep uh, that also includes past exam questions. Now, those mostly take the form of uh, code reading. So I gave you a chunk of code and I say, what is this gonna print out, right? And, and then, uh, of course, the last section is uh, code writing. I explain a problem to you and I say, write code to solve this problem. So there definitely will be questions on the exam that ask you to write some code. One thing to keep in mind if you're asked to write code on the exam, uh, I know that it can be scary to write code on exams. So, uh, one thing I hear a lot is, I've never taken a computer science exam before. Okay, that's, that's fine. I, I really don't think it's much different than a math exam or any other type of exam you've probably taken. Uh, the syntax, right? The, where the curly braces and the semicolons go. On the computer, very, very picky about that stuff, right? On the paper, there's gonna be humans reading it and I'm not so picky about that. If you, I want you to put the semicolons in, right? I want you to put the brackets in the right place. And also keep in mind, if you don't put the brackets in the right place, that can have a very significant effect on the meaning of your code. But in general, the idea is, you know, if Eclipse would underline that missing semicolon and say, hey, put a semicolon here, I'm not gonna take points off for that. You're smart enough to see those kinds of silly little things and fix them on your own, right? I know that you all know that semicolons come at the end of lines. That's not what I'm testing you about. I'm really trying to test you about how well you understand the coding concepts, the tools that we've shown you, and if you can apply those tools properly to solve a problem. That's really what we care about on this exam. So, you know, worry about the semicolons, but don't excessively worry about the semicolons. Uh, most of those little kinds of mistakes are just gonna be uh, looked over. Um, otherwise, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I need to bring to your attention. I don't think so. So I think I'm going to spend the whole rest of this time. I'm, so I don't have a plan for today. My plan for today is to answer questions for you all. Uh, I'm hoping that you all ask me some questions about particular topics. Maybe ask me to do some of the coding questions. I've already got the coding repository loaded up in Eclipse. So if you uh, take a look at some of these coding problems already and there's a particular one that you want me to do in class, I'd be happy to do that now. Or if nobody gives me any suggestions, then probably just start picking some at random to, to do them, but I would love to hear from you all. What concepts would you like to talk about? What problems would you like to see? Yeah? Okay, this was from the exam one question, and it's one of the ones where it says, <coughs> all the choices that will print out the contents of the following array, and it was int, and then bracket, theta equals new int, and it had four options. Uh-huh. And I was wondering if we could skip over that one. I can try to find it. Yeah, it might be a little tricky for me to track that question down, but I think I know which one you're talking about. So give me just a second here. <clears throat> um, that's going to be... Let's see... Would it be this bank? Nope. I, yeah, I understand. I understand. Uh, is it this one? Uh, yes, yes. This one right here? 
Okay, great. So let's get everybody else up to speed on this problem since I managed to track it down. Uh, you're given four snippets of code, which we'll take a look at down here. There's actually multiple problems of this format sprinkled in the quizzes and practice and stuff, right? And so the idea is that you're given this array. Uh, we want to print out the contents of this array, and it, I don't even care what order they're printed out in. Just print out every single item uh, from the array. And then we want to know which of these four loops will accomplish that. So, you know, I realize that during the exam, you won't have access to a computer in which you can type these in and see, see what would happen. That's kind of the point, is if you can examine this without the aid of a computer and understand how this code works. But we, while we're studying, certainly have the benefit of using the computer to help us uh, solve this problem. So, you know, why don't we? Why don't we uh, code it up real quick? and uh, see what we can, and we can review some stuff in the process. Uh, quiz, review. all right. First thing that it did was it created uh, an array called data, right? And it said there would be 10 things in it. So here's a good place to start reviewing. If there's 10 things in this array, the address of the last one, the index of the last one, would be nine. nine, one less than that. One less than that. Why? Why is the last address nine instead of ten? Yeah. It starts counting at zero. Because it starts counting from zero. So that zero takes up the first spot. Everything's kind of off by one a little bit, although the computer doesn't see it that way. That's just how the computer thinks of arrays, thinks of how it stores data. All right, so we've done this. Now we are down here to try and take a look at what some of these code, it's not going to let me copy paste that. No, that's an image. Uh, but this is a while loop, starting i at 10. All right. And i is at 10. We have a while loop that says while i is greater than 0, i minus minus, and then print out the data. So the first time through this loop, i is going to be 10. It hits this line first. That makes it 9, correct? And then it's going to print out whatever is at position 9. So far, I think so good. I think it's going to start at 9, and then it should count down. The question is, will it print all of them? Will it print every single value? See, some people shaking their heads no. Why not? Yeah. It won't print the value at index zero. We don't even need to walk through the loop to see that. We can see that if, well, actually, will it print out the value at index zero? Think about this. It won't, I, I, it's going to stop when i is equal to zero. But when i is one, this is going to make it zero. And then it will print out the value at zero, right? I actually think this will work. And if you want to test it out, we just uh, need to run this. And should hopefully see 10 zeros here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, that works. 10 of them. Yeah, it's a little tricky. I almost fell for it too. I almost fell for it too. This says, well, i is greater than zero, but the subtraction happens after that. So it still works out. Yes? Yeah, I'd be happy to walk through it in the debugger for you. I'm going to set a breakpoint here on line number 10. We start i at 10, but then this is going to subtract 1. So the first value that it tries to get out of the array is actually at position 9, not 10. Right? And then if we keep stepping through, we'll see that i goes down 1. So there's 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Finally, there's i is 1. We still haven't, this is still true. i is equal to 1, right? This is still true not failed this condition yet. So if we step forward, we subtract one more, that makes i zero. We print out the value that's at position zero. Now, I, this is false, right? Zero is not greater than zero, so the loop's over and we're, we're finished. This works, yes? Why is it printing out all zeros? Can somebody help me with that? Why is it printing out all zeros? Yeah. Yeah, there's two ways to create arrays. This way just creates an empty array, where empty means everything is all zeros. 
So that's all that's in this array. It's just all zeros. The question doesn't care. The question does not care what the actual numbers are in the array. It just wants to know if you're going to visit each element of the array. So really, whether it contains all zeros or anything doesn't matter. We're just try trying to see if we have a loop that's going to uh, iterate properly. All right, so this one works. Yeah. I'm sorry? How would you fill the array? I mean, there's a couple different ways you could do it. It depends on what you want to go in there. If you know what you want to go in the array when I'm creating it, I could say something like this and type out 10 values, right? But I have to know what those values are. Or if I don't know what those values are, I mean, if I want my user to type it in, I could have scanner. Or if I just want to set them myself, I can say data at zero is equal to such and such. I mean, there's lots of different ways. It kind of depends on where the data is coming from and when you have it. Um, let's take a look at the next option here. So this one works. This one would be checked. That would need to be a uh, correct answer. Yes. Uh, this one says we're going to start i at 9. i is greater than 0. i minus minus. So we're using a for loop here. is greater than zero. It's still moving in the same direction though, right? It's still starting at the back of the array and moving forward. I believe this is what the code says, right? Is this one gonna work? This one will not work. This one will not work. It's actually only gonna print out, I believe, nine times and I can run that to you and show you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It only ran nine times. Why? So the, even though it looks very similar to the while loop, even this condition was the same, right? But the way that this is applied is a little bit different than, the, than how the while loop was operating. Uh, when i gets to zero, it actually checks this condition before entering the loop. So this would say uh, zero is not greater than zero and we would stop before running zero. If you don't believe me, we can also, of course, run it through the debugger and show you that you know, i starts at nine. We can run it all the way down to one. At this point in time, it subtracts one, which makes i zero, checks the condition, which is now false, and we never print out that last value in position zero because of it. So this one does not work. This one would be left unchecked. Let's try this next one, another for loop. This time we're counting uh, from zero on up, which is probably how most people think of this uh, anyway. i is less than data.length, oh, it said uh, i is less than or equal to data.length minus one, i plus plus. All right, what do we think about this example? This one gonna print out all of the values from the array? I think this one will. You have to be a little bit careful. If I take this off, then we have a problem, right? Then I stop one short. Or if I take this off, then I also have a problem, right? That would that would go one too far, right? Actually. What you have written up here, this will work. I can actually run it and show you. If and you can run it through the debugger yourself if you'd like to. Uh, there's 10 zeros there. I would actually probably prefer to write it like this if it were me. This loop, this loop and the one that I had up here before, which I took from the quiz, are going to be equivalent. They're going to run the same number of times, uh, which is 10. And then the last one, uh, we're going back to a while loop. i starts at zero while i is less than data.length. OK, this is a very straightforward while loop. That extra paren out of here. There we go. So print out the value at i, keep going. Print out the value at i, keep going. Will this one work? You can run it and see. i starts at 0, goes up 1. 
So then it's going to count, right? It's going to count 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. When's it going to stop? That's really the question. So if it's equal to data.length, it's going to stop. Only when it's one less than data.length would it keep going to be strictly less than. So this should work. This should be equivalent to uh, the prior example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yep. So of the four examples that are given here, uh, this one and this one and this one, A, C, and D work. B is the only one that does not. Yes? For a while, you, um, does it plug the value of I into like what is contained within that loop first and then like add or subtract or do whatever operator to it? Well, the while loop's much more direct. You see the adding right here yeah. as part of the body of the while loop, mm -hmm. right? So it just does it in the order that it appears with the rest of the statements in the, in the loop body. Whereas the for loop, remember, it congregates all that stuff, all those three pieces up together. So it kind of does these two back to back. Yes? Can you remind me when did it use a while loop? Yeah, abs loop? absolutely. When should we use a while loop instead of a for loop? Can somebody else help me out? With this one, which we, yeah. Yeah, it depends on if we know the number of iterations or not. So the best example that I have of this, now that you've seen it, is from assignment two, game of NIM. I don't know how, you know, how much of a hard time your TAs gave you, but when somebody comes and plays that game with me, I'm like, type in seven, type in negative two, type in 12, right? Obviously, those are all not valid, but I could sit there and tell you to type in wrong values all day long. You have no idea how many tries it's going to take me to type in a one or a two. No idea. That's entirely up to me. You cannot predict that ahead of time. So a while loop is the way that you repeatedly prompt. If you know exactly how many times you need to do something, I need to print out every element of this array. Well, that means I need a loop that's going to run once for every element in that array. That, I know that, right? Even if I don't know exactly how big that array is, I can ask the array how big it is and write a loop to repeat that many times. For loop's considered the best tool for that job. That being said, many problems can be written either way. And on the exam, I'm not going to care if you uh, get it done with a for loop or a while loop, as long as you get it done. Question? Can you explain why B doesn't work again? Can I explain why B doesn't work? When it, it's not going to print out the value of position 0. So when we get down to i is equal to 1, it's going to subtract the 1 from that. That makes it 0. Then it's going to test the condition. 0 is not greater than 0. That's false. So it's going, to, it's going to stop. And it will never execute this line for i is equal to 0, which is the very first or last element of the array, depending on how you look at it. Question? You didn't see what now? So like, what are we trying to, like how would we know like that it's A and not B? Like we're trying to print like 10 times, is that what we're asking or? You're trying to print out the contents of the array. Okay. I want to see all of the elements of this array. So just going 10 times isn't enough. If I were to, you know, take one of these loops and write it like this, this is going to run 10 times, but it's going to print out the value in position 7 each time. That's not what I asked for. I want to see each value printed out one time. Uh, any other questions on this problem before we head to another one? Yeah. Uh, so, in example A, yeah. Uh, actually, I think if you if you move the minus minus down, you you run into some problems, right? If I say i minus minus first, wait, is it? Uh, oh, the i minus minus was first. You want me to have it second? I'm sorry. If I move the i minus minus to make it second, think about uh, the order that things are going to happen here. I starts at 10. The first thing it says is print out whatever value is at position i. Well, we've already hit a problem, right? Position 10 does not exist. There are 10 things in this array. That is true. But the position of the last one is 9. 
so if we don't subtract one out of this first then we're gonna get I can show you we're gonna get uh, good old oops did I get an infinite loop it's because of the condition I need to rewrite I didn't write this condition properly I is greater than zero there we go we're gonna get an array index out of bounds exception because 10 is not a valid index. Cool. All right, who's got another question for me? Where, what question do we want to take a look at next? Yeah. I was wondering, I have another question about this one. Oh, okay. Um, why is it only printing out zeros, like, and not like eight, seven, six? Like, I don't know if it's a question. I, I believe I already answered that one before, so you can uh, watch the video after I post it and take a look. Who's got another question for me? Yeah. For D? For B? Okay, so we run the body of the loop, we subtract one, we test the condition. Run the body of the loop, subtract one, test the condition. That's how all loops work, not just this one. That's correct, yes. All right, where are we going next? Who's got another question for me? Who's got another question for me? Yeah. To include a space, I, I mean, white space, that's a tricky, I wouldn't worry about that on the exam, for sure, yeah. Don't worry about small stuff like that on the exam. Not a thing you need to worry about. You're not gonna get counted off for missing a space between words, that's not gonna happen. And if it does, submit a regrade request and I will give you the point back. Yes? I was wondering if we could look at, um it was one of the exercises for module three. Okay. And it was the one that was asking us to like find the sum of all of the uh, all the values stored in row like two. Uh, can you direct me? Yeah, it was in the uh, module three and then the like the exercises. Oh, module, okay. Yeah. Some then, second row. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so here's an exercise. It says we want to write code that will sum and print the values of the second row of the array. So here's the array, and this is this is a two-dimensional array, right? We've got rows and columns. How many rows are here? Three. Three, and there's three columns too, right? There's three columns too. Uh, so we need to write code that's going to pull out this second row and sum it up. And the way this problem's worded is a little bit ambiguous, but we'll, we'll deal with it. Um, so in this particular case, I know in a lot of other situations, I've uh, illustrated the, um, the loop within a loop structure. What do we call that when I have a loop inside of a loop? Yeah. Nested, good, yeah, awesome. Uh, and so it might be your first inclination that, okay, we're dealing with a two-dimensional array, maybe I need a nested loop. I actually don't think that's the case here. And to understand why that's not the case, consider that we know exactly which row we want. Right? We know exactly which row we want. So the row is not changing. The row is constant. It's only the column that needs to change. And that means we don't need two loops. We really just need one. We just need one loop that's going to iterate down the columns for us for the selected row. OK. That makes things a lot easier. So I want to make a loop that starts at column zero and ends at the very last column. How do I get the total number of columns out of this guy? My, my array is called table. How do I get the total number of columns out of this? So it's not this. This is rows. rows. Table, zero. table zero length. The idea here is that we're going to the zero with row and taking the length of that. So the length of a row tells me the number of columns. 
i plus plus. We need to compute the sum. Where are we going to put the sum? We need to have a variable for that, probably. So let's make a variable. Started at zero. Our sum is going to get added. We're going to, we're going to extract a value from the array. Which value is the row and which value is the column? First one is the row, second one is the column. So if we want the second row, this is a little ambiguous. I should have been a bit more specific about how I specified this. Uh, you know, do I want row one or row two here? Whatever. I don't really care about that too much. What I care more about is that we have I in the column space so that the first time through it pulls out the value in column zero, second time through pulls out the value in column one until it hits all of the columns. And then when we get down here, we can just uh, print out the sum. If I run this, I'm hoping I see 18 come back out, right? That's the sum of 11 plus 4 plus 3. So let's give this a whirl. Yeah, cool. And if I you know, switch it to a different row, this should give me this sum now, right? 2 plus 2 is 4 plus 3 is 7. There we go. Cool. Looks good. Any questions on this one before we move to another? OK. Anybody have another problem they'd like for me to go over, talk about, work through? Yes? Uh huh. Yeah, no, I know which problem you're talking about. Is it this? Is it this one? That is an error that I fixed like a week ago, so I don't know if there needs to be a refresh on your browser or something. No, it's all good. That was a mistake. I screwed it up and punched it in wrong, but yeah, it should have been fixed. Yep. Where else we going? Who has a problem they want to see me work through? Anybody? If not, I'm just going to start going through some of these, uh, some of these coding prep problems here. Yes? Not necessarily a problem, but will there be multiple answers and stuff like that? Questions set up like that on the exam? I mean, these are past exam questions. I don't, I'm not going to tell you what's going to be on your exam. That's not really the point, right? I was just curious. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I don't have a Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, that's not the right one. So just types of various expressions like this? Yeah. So if I see something like this, what am I looking for to determine the type? Decimal point. If I see that decimal point in there, I know... Double. double. It's got to be a double, even though there's integers in there as well. That double is going to win, right? Or whatever, however you want to think about it. If I'm doing math and a decimal point enters the arithmetic at any point, it's sticking around. It's not going anywhere. That decimal point's staying. Yeah? I was actually talking about the questions where it's like the balance of those. And then it has like multiple types of things. I mean, there's a bajillion of those. I mean, I, I'm happy to. Can you go over? OK. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, if we take a look at uh, this one, it's asking for the value of this guy. I see there's an OR operation here in the middle, but before we can resolve that, we have to resolve what's on the left and what's on the right. So 7 is less than 3, that's very clearly false. 9 is equal to 2, that's also false. So false or, or false is going to give me false, just per the truth tables. Yep. 
Uh, all right, here we've got our good friend Modulus. So Modulus, how does that fit into the order of operations? You've heard of PEMDAS or whatever acronym you want to use to remember of order of operations. Modulus fits in with multiplication and division, right? So that modulus is going to happen first. We're not going to do the addition first. We're going to do probably this one first. So what is 7 modulus 2? One. It should be 1. It's the remainder after division. So one, one thing to keep in mind with modulus, the answer is always going to be less than whatever this number is. Always. The only possible answers that I can get with a modulus of 2 are either 0 or 1. That's it. Those are the only possible answers that I can get for remainders, right? So this is going to be a remainder of 1. This one is going to be 5 goes in 3 times with a remainder of 4. So 1 plus 4 should give me 5 for this problem. Uh, here's the one that somebody just asked me about a second ago, uh, about the spacing. Um, so here we can see we've got this mess in parentheses to take a look at first. Uh, True, okay, that's good, that's easy. And operations need a true on both the left and the right. So the left side is very clearly true. Let's see if the right side is true. Uh, it's not. Four is greater than four, that's false. So this whole thing inside parentheses is gonna be false. So the answer is gonna be false love. I know, very depressing. Um, yeah, we can try one of these. So here, order of operations, is still in effect, I'm going to do this one first. What's the result of just this part? 3-3. Three, three. It's not addition. It's that big word that starts with a C that I made you say when you demoed assignment one. It's concatenation, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we get 3-3 three, three out of that, but then this, I guess this technically happens first. We do add those together. We get the 6, then we get the 3-3. Three, three. But this is going to be a string, right? Not the number 33, but the string 33. So the string 33 concatenated with a 6 gets me 336. Question? So there was one question like that, but on the other side of the parentheses, it had another one plus 3, and it didn't add that. Uh, I'm, I mean, without seeing the actual problem, I'm not sure. Okay, so we would do parentheses first, that gets me 2. Then we would do this operation next, that gets me 1, 1, plus the 2, gets me 1, 1, 2, and then plus the 1 gets me 1, 1, 2, 1. No, the order of operation says if I have multiple addition operations, I do them from left to right. I'm not sure that that actually is a, the, the types have no effect on it at all. It's pure order of operations. This happens first because it's in the parentheses. This happens next because there are three additions, but this is the leftmost one. That's why we do this one next. This is a string. The result of this is one, one as a string. Absolutely, yes. Any other questions? Yes. Be happy to, yes. This one here? Password generator one? Okay, great. Here we've got a string array of characters, right? So we've got an array of strings, and these are the characters that are acceptable to be used within a password. So what our job is then is to randomly select characters out of this array to make a password for you. We ask the user how many characters they want their password to have. So if they type in eight, then I'm going to generate a password that has eight random characters in it. So I'm randomly going to select eight letters out of this big array of letters that I've got here, right? If they type it in 12, then I'll make 12 long, so on and so forth. Okay. So 
I know how many times I need to pick something out of this array. That tells me there's some repetition going involved. I know how many repetitions I want. So this is a good spot to use a for loop. For me, I'm probably going to write it out something like this. i is less than the length i plus plus. We're also going to need somewhere to store the password that we're creating. So we need a variable to, to you know, store the, the password. And the way it's going to work is we're going to randomly select a character and just kind of tack it onto the end of that password, one, one at a time. So let's make that variable here. And when we first start out, I haven't randomly selected any characters yet. So a good thing for me to start this password at would be just, what's this called? Empty string, empty string. It would be like the equivalent of setting an integer equal to zero. We've seen this before. This is not the first time this has popped up in class. All right, so I've got my empty string. I want to randomly select one of these characters. So I need to pick an index between zero and whatever the length of this array is, right? I don't even tell you what the length of this, of this character's array is, but we can, we can ask that question. How do I generate a random number between zero and whatever the length of that array is? We're gonna use math.random. So math.random gives me values between zero and one. How do I stretch it so that it gives me values between zero and the length of the array? What am I gonna do? I'm gonna multiply it by characters dot length. And then one final thing that I'm going to need to do is cast it to an integer. Because this is about to be used as an index, right, into this character array. In fact, I'm going to create a variable that says as much. An index into an array must be an int, right? I can't go to position two and a half in an array. That doesn't exist. So it has to be an integer. But this, I'm arguing, is going to give me a value between zero and the length of the array. It's going to give me a, a value that will appro get, can appropriately be used as an index. It's not going to give me any that are too big, and it's not going to give me any that are too small. Does anybody need another explanation of how that line of code works. OK. So then the next thing that we're going to do is we're just going to grab something out of the array. And we're going to concatenate it onto our password. We're going to add that letter on. So we're going to say characters at index here. And that's it. I'll add a print line down here so that we can see our results. And we can give it a go. Eight characters. There we go. And if I run it again and I say, give me eight characters, it should give me a different one, right? Yep. Uh, 16. Oops. Yeah. 20. Seems to be, seems to be working pretty well. Yes. I don't know that that's a safe assumption to make or not. The exam is uh, the exam is two hours long. I'm not going to ask you, you know, so many questions that it takes over that time allotment. Yes. How many long form questions? Show up on Thursday and find out. I don't I don't understand. If somebody can explain to me how that would help you study for the exam, then maybe I would give you the answer to that question. But I don't think that material is going to help you study for the exam or not. Yes? Do you understand the material? Yeah. Then stop studying. You're ready. That's what the exam is for. Yes? Would we um, lose points for that? 
Oh, like you just put like uh, 32 here or whatever? I mean, I guess not, but you're just wasting your time? Yeah. Sitting here counting them all? Yeah. This is definitely gonna be a quicker, quicker route to what you're looking for. I don't, I don't want to see hard numbers hard-coded. That's definitely not what I'm looking for. Yeah. And, and on a lot of these problems, I mean, you're, you are, so while this particular problem, maybe I wouldn't take off for that, on other ones, yeah, definitely, that would be worthy of taking points off. Some of the problems specifically say this should work for arrays of any size. So if you hard-code a length in there, that's not going to work for arrays of any size. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what else we got? Any any questions on this problem before we go to another one? Yeah, up there. Well, so math.random does not include one, and that actually is a good thing for us. The fact that it doesn't include one means that if this is only, you know, if the length of the array is only 10, just to keep the numbers easy, this is going to go from 0 to 9.99999. It'll never be 10, ever. When I cast this to an int, what happens? It chops the decimal off. So the biggest value that I can get is 9.9999 chopped down to 9. I'll never get 10. So actually, it's a good thing for us that math.random does not include the upper bound. Does that make sense? OK. Was there another hand I saw somewhere? Or yes. Um, I have a question about the module three exercises in nine colors. Okay. Sure thing. All right. Wants us to uh, create a two-dimensional array with uh, these uh, colors in them. Okay. Must be two dimensionals, and the type should very clearly be strings, right? Based on what we're seeing here. So if I want to make a string two dimensional array, it's going to look something like that. That says string two dimensional array. And there's two ways you can create arrays, and there's you know two ways you can approach this problem. One way would be to make an empty array and then go back and fill it later. But since you know what the stuff is, I would actually probably prefer to do it like this: red, yellow blue, and then come down here for my second row and put in uh, orange, green, purple. So that takes care of part one, making the two-dimensional array. Whoops, I got too many brackets here. There we go. That takes care of part one, making the two-dimensional array. The second part was just to print it out. And this is a, a great application of our nested uh, for loop structure for two-dimensional arrays. So really, the you know it's good to know that about this nested for loop structure. The question is, does it apply to this particular two-dimensional array problem or not? If I'm trying to visit each element in the array exactly one time, that is, that is your cue to use this uh, nested for loop. Um, oh, I forgot to give this a name, didn't I? Colors. There we go. Uh, dot length. So this loop is for the rows. This loop is for the columns. Uh, and then we need to retrieve a value from our array by plugging in the row, which is i, and the column, which is j. So if we run this as is, we'll see that we've got, OK getting there. It's all smashed together, so you know maybe you want to tack on like a space in between. On the exam, I'm probably not going to be nearly this picky, but since we're here, I can try and make this look a little nicer. All right, now they're spaced out, but then if I want to move down to the next line, I can also come down here and just put in a print line statement to move us down to the next row. 
And then, there we go. Beautiful. Matches the structure exactly. Any questions on this problem? Yes. No, I mean, I'm doing them now. Uh, you are always all welcome to ask on Piazza. Happy to go through any problems online yet. I really want to encourage you to write these out yourselves. That is the best way to practice. That's the best way to study, in my opinion. Get your hands on the keyboard. Do the typing. Yeah. Uh, what other questions? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, that's actually relevant to the problem that we just did. The, this problem said, you know, print out the array. And if you tried to just print out the array directly like this, then you would see this. And that's not what we're after, right? This is, this is what, the example that I showed you last week. Um, so you can't just print out the array all in one go like this. What you have to do is you have to visit each element of the array, do an array traversal, that's what we'd call it. Visit each element of the array one at a time and print them out one at a time. So that's what this, for the case of a two-dimensional array, that's what this uh, nested for loop structure is for. For a one-dimensional array, you just need one loop, right? To do the same thing. Uh, what's next? Somebody have an uh, exercise or an example you'd like to see? Yes. Question four, yep. Okay. So we're given, <clears throat> this is another array problem, and I'm, I'm not surprised that we're getting a lot of array problems. Uh, we're given this two-dimensional array called data, and we want to select random points. So there's some similarities, actually, with some of the problems that we've already kind of seen and looked at here. Uh, we want to select random values out of this and stick them into a new array, a new one-dimensional array of size n called points. So the, here's that array that's created for us down here. Right? We ask, how many random points do you want? So the first, you know, we say we want three random values. All right, so it's going to pick, what, the four and put it into this array. And then it's going to pick the two and put it into this array. And then maybe it'll pick the four again. I don't know. Right? and put it into the array. There's nothing stopping it from randomly picking the same value more than once, correct? At least this problem doesn't require that. So let's do it. This is a, another example of, okay, you see two-dimensional array and think, hmm, do I need that nested for loop structure? Are we going to see every item from this two-dimensional array? Not necessarily. How many, how many repetitions, what's the repetitions based on? Is it based on how many things are in my two-dimensional array? What's the repetitive thing that I'm doing here? I am repeatedly randomly selecting items out of here, right? How many times am I repeating that random selection? Well, I'm repeating that random selection n times. And I'm going to put them into this one-dimensional array. So we actually don't need a nested loop here. We can actually do this with just one, one loop that's going to run n times. Uh, in this case, you could use points.length if you wanted to. You could also just use n here. I think both are totally reasonable, totally acceptable. All right, so within this loop, I want to randomly select values out of this two-dimensional array. In order to pick a single value out of this two-dimensional array, I actually need two randomly selected values, one for the row and one for the column. So let's pick the row first. Here's math.random again. So I need a value that's between 0 and whatever the largest row is. Well, that's just going to be multiplied by data.length. That tells me the number of rows, right? So if there's three rows, then this is going to give me a random value multiplied by 3. 
And we know then that that would give me a value of between 0 and 2.999999 repeating. I wish to make that into an index, so I'll add my integer cast out on the front again to make sure that's an integer value. And that's it. That'll do it for my row. I'm going to stick another, I, I just copy pasted that line. I'm going to tweak it a little bit to make it work for the columns instead of, you know, data.length over here. I'm going to say data at zero dot length. This tells me the number of columns. So here's my randomly selected row. Here's my randomly selected column. I'm now going to pull the value out of my, oops, that's not the right array. I'm going to pull the value out of my data array using the randomly selected row and column. And I'm going to put it into my points array at position i. I believe this is it. I believe this solves what the problem is asking for. This amount of code right here. And hopefully you've noticed that both this problem and the last problem don't require pages and pages and pages of code writing, right? If you understand this material, you understand the tools and how they can be applied, these answers should be fairly straightforward. Should not require you to write a, a, a book to answer any of these problems. If you find yourself in that position thinking, oh, I'm going to have to fill up this page and two others to solve this, then that's an indication to me that maybe you're missing an application of a loop somewhere that can help eliminate some of that repetitive stuff for you. Um, though the problem didn't ask for it, we could verify that this works by uh, iterating through this array and you know, printing out the values that got randomly selected. And so for this one, I'll just take three random points, and it shows six, five, and four. OK, sure, that's fine. And if I run it again, I should and take three more random points. All right, this time I got one, five, and three. OK, that's fine. Uh, if I do a lot of random points, then I'll see it's going to get some repeats in there. Yeah, there we go. But still doing what I asked it to, giving me 10 random values. Couple things here before I wrap this problem up, though. For starters, this is definitely one where uh, I've given you this array of data, data values that you can use to kind of practice. But on the exam, here's what this is going to look like. It's going to look like this. Oops, not like that. Sorry. Stop. Stop doing that. Ah, Eclipse really wants me to. It's just going to say dot 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 in between the brackets. I'm not going to show you what the data is. The, the data doesn't matter, right? The data does not matter. Or another way of thinking about this is that your code should work regardless of what values are inside of these brackets, as the comment implies. So if I come up through here and I add another row, right, with more values, I want the code that I wrote to still be functional. And it is. I know that it is because I didn't hard code in three here. I used data.length, right? I didn't, oh, actually, that would have been two. But anyway, yeah. Question? Oh, yeah, you can definitely print out the points up here in this loop and avoid the need for this loop, yeah. I wrote this, though, in part to also illustrate uh, for each loop which is also fair game uh, on the exam. So for each loop, iterating by value as opposed to by index through a collection, right? Uh, another thing about the for each loop, this is always going to be an array, right? If I'm, not, if I'm not working with arrays, then for each loops are not even in the realm of tools that I'm considering using on this exam, right? If there's an array involved, then OK for each loops are on the table. It's up to you whether you really want to use one or whether you just want to iterate by index. Although, I can always write a for each loop on the exam if I want to, so you still need to be prepared to examine that kind of code if, it's, if it shows up. Uh, any questions about this? Did you? Yes. Yeah, so for a two-dimensional array, this tells us the, 
for, let me take a step back. For a one-dimensional array, this just tells us how many things are in the array, right? For a two-dimensional array, this does not tell me how many things are in the array. This just tells me how many rows are in the array. This is the statement that we use to tell us how many columns are in the array. And to understand why this is here, what we're actually doing is saying go to row zero and take the length of that. The length of a row is equal to the number of columns, right? Any other questions on this before we go to another problem? We still have time to do at least one or two more. Did I see a problem over here? Yeah. Uh, I think typically I ass have you assume only positive stuff. I guess I didn't actually say that here. But on the exam, the question will definitely be clear. Yeah, very clear and direct as to what is expected. Uh, yes? I have a question about the random number exam. Okay. And it was the one that said most of all people always able that would generate random numbers between 3 and 7, 7 exclusive. Now I'm just having trouble with the parentheses. Um, it was from the practice quiz. I think it was probably in here, maybe. Oh, maybe not. I don't remember which question bank that one is going to be in. I know which problem you're talking about. I just uh, am trying to figure out how to get it up on the screen. Hmm. I mean, I. I think the maybe the better thing to do would be to just talk about how to generate random values in a range uh, in general because we've already seen it happen a couple times, yeah. and it's happened in the past as well. I mean, it's something you have to do on this week's homework assignment as well to simulate uh, rolling dice, for example. There's a formula, and I uh, definitely remember going through this formula in class. We actually aren't using part of the formula here, though. Why not? What's part of the you know random number generation formula isn't hasn't been relevant to us. The lower bound, right? So in the cases we've seen so far, we've been generating random values to represent the index of an array. And the index always starts at 0. So that's why we haven't had to worry about uh, doing any additional offset or anything like that. But if we did want to you know, do an offset, we can have an additional parameter out here that says, OK, don't start from 0. We're going to shift it up 1. Uh, this is going to be the range. So this would be, uh, you know, instead of 0 to 1, this would take me from 0 to 3, not, not inclusive of 3. And then we shift it up 1, so that would take me from 1 to 4, not inclusive of 4. Um, so just by changing these two values, this one represents the range. This one represents the offset, the, where we want our numbers to start from. We can generate any random range of values that we wish. So the problem that you're referring to, I know where it is, I just can't, I can't find it. I mean, it's really just asking you to apply that formula. Yep. Uh, what other questions do you all have? Should I just pick a coding problem at random? Yeah. Of the coding problems? This one? OK. So this problem is asking you to consider uh, this idea of upper triangular arrays. So if you've taken linear algebra, you maybe have run into these before. If you haven't, it's actually not that difficult of a concept to understand. It's a square array. So there, there will definitely be equal numbers of rows and columns. And then all the values on the diagonal from the upper left to the bottom right are ones. And then everything above that is also a one. That's why it's called an upper triangular, the upper half. Uh, the upper triangle is all ones, and the bottom is all zeros. So we want to provide code where the user says what the value of n is. If they say uh, n is 5, then we wish to generate this exact one, right? It has five rows and five columns. If they say that n is 7, then I want to see you know, the same thing, except with seven rows and seven columns, right? That's what this problem is asking us to do. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, work through this one. First thing we need to do is create the array. So we'll go ahead and create
create it as an array. I, I believe it wants doubles, although really, if you use ints here, the values are all zero and one, so I, I don't think I was even that picky about it, right? Uh, int is fine. Um, we'll call it, uh, I don't know what we're gonna call it. We're gonna call it upper triangle. That's what we're gonna call it. And we're gonna make it as a new array where it's square, so whatever value of n the user has typed in is gonna be used for both the rows and the columns. And at this point in time, you know, this is a default array. We know it's all filled with zeros. So really all we have to do is write the code that's gonna fill the upper part with ones. You don't have to touch the zeros, they're already there. When we create an empty array like this, the zeros are already in there. It's all zeros right now. So we really just have to figure out how to do this. And you might be thinking, all right, two-dimensional array, is this the time to use the nested loop structure? Well, I just said we don't have to visit these elements down here, but even though that is the case, I think using a nested loop is probably a good idea. We do have to vary the row and the column, right, to visit all of these spots. So these, these ones occur over multiple rows and multiple columns. So that tells me that really, I, I think a nested for loop is still probably gonna do the, the trick for me here. I'll write it in the traditional way. Actually, I'm just gonna use n here to make it a little simpler. Now the trick is that we only need to do something in a certain, certain case. So what is the case that we need to actually manipulate the values in the array? How do I know when I'm either on the diagonal or above it? Is really kind of the question here. It's gonna be based on the values of i and j. I know I'm on the diagonal when what is true? When i is equal to j, I must be on the diagonal, right? This is zero, zero, this is one, one, this is two, two, all the way down, right? Zero, zero. So what must be true if I'm up here somewhere? I is the row, which is gonna be less than J, which is the column. So if I is less than or equal to J, I need to put a one there. Otherwise, I don't need to do anything. Well, we can say that. If I is less than or equal to J, then upper triangle equal to one. Uh, I think this will do it. I don't think it asked, yeah, it didn't ask you to print out the array or anything like that. So for the purposes of answering the question that you were given, that's, that's it. But if you wanna actually verify, right, that it works and does, you know, what it's supposed to, we're gonna need to print out the contents, which I can do by borrowing this uh, nested loop structure again, and printing out each of these elements one at a time. Like so. <clears throat> So this bottom part not technically required as part of the uh, question, but since we want to see, I'll type in 10. Oh, beautiful, yes, there it is. Type in, uh, what, 50, ooh, uh, that's fun. Works. This is the good stuff, though. Any questions? Yes? What's the purpose of adding that empty string with it? Oh. At the bottom. Okay, so this part right here? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked me about that, actually, because I kind of glossed over it, but it's worth talking about. I've got my nested loops here. This one's for the rows, and this one's for the columns, right? Notice that I only use print here. That keeps things on the same line but I eventually want to move down. And when do I want to move down? I want to move down at the end 
of every row. I want to move down to the next line and start printing from there. So pay attention to where this is. It's at the end of this loop. It's not inside of this loop, right? It's within this loop. Uh, you know, we can experiment with this in a few different ways. What if I take it out? What happens? And I type in, you know, I'm going to keep it uh, maybe on the smaller side this time. Oh, now it's just all a straight line. Well, that's not. I want it to actually look like the the rectangle, the square, right? So by having this here, that actually tells us to move down at the end of every row, so that we can actually see the appropriate shape. Yeah, good question. Any other questions about this problem? Uh, we've got nine minutes left. I can do like maybe one quick one if anybody's got one they think is kind of quick-ish that they would like to see me work through. If there's not, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it and you're welcome to come up and chat with me after if you have any additional questions you'd like to talk about. I'm getting ready to do a whole nother one right after this. So if you want to stick around and do more review with the next section, you're welcome to do that as well. Thanks, everybody, and I'll see you on Thursday for the exam.